Hello everyone, so thanks uh, to be working the after lunch. I hope you enjoyed uh, our last lunch. I hope you enjoyed our last session. So this is our keynote on politics. And I'm going to just introduce uh, the chair for this session, who's uh, Kevin Miller from the UCL Institute of the Americas, and he's going to be in charge of now. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, I suppose. It's a uh, testimony to the uh, well-known uh, personality and, and favor of our uh, keynote speaker. We have such a strong and diverse audience on the summer afternoon uh, in, uh, in July. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Denise Gresson. Um, also, almost certainly well known to uh, many of you. Uh, she is currently a professor of political science at Tom in Mexico City. She holds a PhD in political science from Princeton University and has, of course, it's published very extensively on Mexican politics and U.S. Mexican relations. And she writes a weekly column for both Reforma and Proceso uh, and in 2010 won the National uh, Journalism Award. She's currently a member of the Mexico, of Mexico City's Human Rights Commission, and she'll be speaking to us this afternoon on reshaping our democracy, power, and the role of civil society in Mexico. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nelson. It's a pleasure to be here. I've known Kevin for uh, how many years? 30, perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> Since I was finishing my doctoral dissertation at the Center for U.S. Mexican Studies, and he was there at the time. So it's a pleasure to see you again, Kevin, and thank you for introducing me. I'm especially happy to be here with my son, Samuel. Uh, who is uh, accompanying me on this journey and uh, also rediscovering his home country after spending a couple of years studying in Canada. Um, the narrative of Enrique Peña Nieto's government moving Mexico lasted less than three years. The triumphant headlines, the celebratory media coverage, the endless applause, the president who was going to save Mexico, according to the cover of Time magazine. The time that would end the nightmare of paralysis and violence that had characterized the two periods of his predecessors. That was the way many spoke, celebrated, endorsed, but it seems that that era of collective adulation has reached an end as exemplified by the increasingly critical coverage of the media over the last several months and by the fact that today Enrique Peña Nieto has the lowest approval ratings of any Mexican president in the last 20 years. Today the narrative is not about reforms, it's about possible regression. It is not about Mexico moving forward, but about Mexico moving backward. It is not about the Mexican moment, but rather about the Mexican morass. Because of the assassinations and then the attempted cover-up of civilians in La Playa, because of the 43 allegedly incinerated students in Ayotzinapa, because of the conflict of interest cases that underscore the growth of deep-rooted corruption that the government has either denied or ignored, because of the uncanny escape of the notorious drug lord in Chapel from an allegedly high-security prison, because the price of oil is dropping, the peso is devaluing, and the Peña Nieto government is faltering in its response to a crisis of confidence that it doesn't even believe exists, especially in the aftermath of midterm elections in which the PRI, in alliance with the Green Party, won the majority in Congress. 
But that crisis of confidence is evident for those of us who actually live in the country. <laughs> in the weeks after Ayotzinapa erupted, the, the president seemed almost double struck paralyzed, without leadership, without proposals, without government decisions to defend or actions to carry out, without a cabinet that knew how to explain what had happened in Iguala or how to deal with it, without a team that could operate with efficiency, act with celerity, react with sensitivity. Instead, what we saw and what we have seen since then is a government that knows how to market its image but not how to defend it, a government that allegedly knew how to save Mexico by negotiating structural reforms but not by preventing deaths, ending violence, or getting the economy back on track. Along with this, the not surprising discovery that Mexico does not have a justice system that can investigate, identify, prosecute, rely on DNA samples, solve murders, or prevent them. What I always say about Mexico is, uh, hablamos del Estado de Derecho como si existiera. So this, along with the revelation that the crimes we have witnessed are being perpetrated by colluded policemen, members of the military who are not trained to deal with civilians, homicidal municipal presidents, negligent govern, govern, governors, and a lethargic president. In the extraordinary photograph that my friend Canaro Rosano took of the first march of 50,000 people protesting for the missing in Ayotzinapa, there was a huge sign in the center of the Zócalo that said it was the state. And so it was, a state that cannot protect, defend, investigate, punish, carry out its foundational mission. Instead, what we've seen are government authorities that have been as missing as the students they search for, or as the criminal they search for. I think there is nothing quite as emblematic of the state of misgovernment in Mexico as the photo that was recently circulated of the Attorney General peering into the hole through which El Chapo had disappeared. So after Ayotzinapa and since then, the numbers add up to 43 plus 1. And that additional 1 is the president of a country that has not passed the basic taste test of leadership as defined by John Kenneth Galbraith, which is to unequivocally confront the anxiety of his own people. He has not confronted that, that anxiety, he has added to it. And uh, it would be, I think, illustrative for you to read a recent piece in the Financial Times regarding the real reason the Mexican peso seems to be losing its strength. And many would argue that this has to do with what is happening with the US dollar. But what the investigation that the FT correspondent carried out in Mexico and revealed is that what's happening in the country is that ordinary Mexican households are changing their savings from Mexican pesos into dollars, underscoring, as I said, a deep-rooted crisis of confidence. It now seems that much of what was offered, promised, negotiated, agreed upon has not been enough. Not labor reform, not education reform, not telecoms reform, not energy reform. Everything that was going to transform the economy, liberalize labor markets, improve the quality of education, strengthen public finances, modernize the energy sector via private investment everything that was going to propel us to the first world, to prosperity, to the group of emerging markets with high growth rates, to the same place that Carlos Salinas promised us we would be 30 years ago. So why are we in this situation? What happened first, politically speaking? What went wrong? 
what happened to begin with the shocking disclosure of what many who work in human rights organizations have known for years, that Mexico has become a country of clandestine graves, of falsas clandestinas, that Mexico has become a country where students are kidnapped by police forces and supposedly burned to death, a country of bone fragments and charred remains, years of corpses without a name, weeks of corpses without an identity, days of corpses that the government has no answer for, are constant absences that resonated little before Argentina. A singular case, but similar to the thousands that Mexico has lived with since the beginning of the ill-fated war on drugs. Singular because the government was forced to react as a result of pressure from below, from civil society, and pressure from above, international scrutiny. But similar because the reaction has been so bad. And that is why what the Mexican Attorney General back then, Murillo Pagan, called the historic truth, la verdad historica, that should lead to a case closed is viewed by many as a government tactic designed to simply turn the page, overcome Ayotzinapa, forget the dead, move on to moving Mexico. Impossible, I believe, to do so in the face of unanswered questions. Impossible to do so in the absence of a scientific consensus about what happened in that garbage dump in Okula where the students were allegedly murdered. Impossible to do so in the light of so many inconsistent statements by those involved, many of whose confessions were extracted via torture. Also because 10 months after the incident, the Mexican government has been unable to detain many of those presumed guilty. <clears throat> Uh, because the behavior of that uh, of the army that fatal night has not been sufficiently investigated. Because we still don't know what happened in Guerrero in terms of political corruption that unleashed the violence that turned Iguala into the most dangerous municipality in the country. And what is so <laughs> shocking is that the government knew this. Official government numbers from the Secretaria de Seguridad Pública have been indicating for three years now, according to Pepe Merino, my colleague, Eritam, that the rate of homicides in Iguala was much higher than anywhere else. Also, impossible to simply turn the page because the Argentine forensic team that was brought in to advise on the case has disputed the investigation presented by the Attorney General. This was Murillo Caran, who became the catalyst, as you know, for a worldwide hashtag movement called Yame Kanse, and as he declared in a press conference about Ayotzinapa. And just two days ago, the Mexican Human Rights Commission issued a critical report of the government's actions in Ayotzinapa and stated that the case is not closed. And finally, we are awaiting the final report of the interdisciplinary group named by the Inter-American Human Rights Commission. And it appears that it will declare that 42 students are still missing. 10 months and so many unanswered questions. How could Jose Luis Abarca have been nominated as the candidate for the municipal presidency of Iguala when uh, his wife had five direct family members, her brothers, who were in jail due to their links with organized crime. Why didn't the Attorney General's office act back in March when local activists presented evidence of the municipal president's involvement in three homicides in the state. What led the policemen of Popula and Iguala to react 
the way they did vis-a-vis -vis the students that night with such violence. Um, why did they shoot at them? And why did they turn them over to Guerreros Unidos, the criminal group that is now operating in the state, the state that provides 42% of the production of, let's say, Anapola uh, in Mexico? Why is it that among the charred, at the ashes in Popula, they didn't find any single metal object, such as the belt buckles, or even the, um, the, the, the fillings of the teeth of the missing students? Why is it that those who are under investigation or in jail right now and the trials haven't even begun. Why haven't they been wanted now for forced disappearances, which is what the Inter-American Human Rights Commission is calling them? Um, I recommend that you read the book by Esteban Nieves that came out last week called La Noche Más Triste, which ends with these unanswered questions that we are still awaiting a response for. Now, despite the specificities of the case, Ayotzinapa reveals a pattern. Ayotzinapa already occurred and continues to occur for the thousands of Mexican families in search of a lost son, a kidnapped daughter, a father that no one can find. We are witnessing a pattern of forced disappearances that government officials do not investigate and state authorities that do not initiate criminal investigations, that do not assure justice, that do not provide reparations for the families. A perverse pattern of impunity that generates incentives for more kidnappings, for more people at risk. A perverse pattern that stems from the absence of mechanisms, protocols, and resources to confront a problem that we can no longer Almost 24,000 people have gone missing in Mexico over the past 10 years. This is documented by Amnesty International, by Human Rights Watch, by the United Nations, by dozens of Mexican human rights NGOs. A history of deaths and doubts, criminals and accomplices, broken hearts and broken lives. A history revealed and amplified by Ayotzinapa that has led thousands to march, to mobilize, to criticize, to question. The dark history that corruption has simply added another chapter to. And if you remember, Bill Clinton's presidential campaign team had a sign posted in its campaign war room that stated, it's the economy, stupid in order to keep the team focused on the key issue. Inyamito should do the same, but the sign behind every government desk in Mexico should be, it's the corruption, stupid. Because an issue that used to be subsidiary has now become central. Because a topic that never seemed to impact the credibility of the government is now doing so. Um, a theme that was considered historically normal, now is not. Government corruption is a corrosive acid that runs through the reformist narrative, undermining its appeal. Blocking, postponing, grinding to a halt what had been promised and what could have been achieved. According to a poll conducted by Stephen Morris, 70% believe that everyone in the Mexican government is corrupt. Within the private sector, 39% admit that they need to make extra official payments to influence the content of laws, regulatory measures, and public policy. Among internal auditors of the government, 60% recognize that they frequently encounter areas of corruption in the areas that they supervise. Among the population, 62% respond, responds that it has been necessary to pay a bribe to resolve the problem. Corruption is born and flourishes in those 
official areas um, where a decision needs to be made. In the courts, in the criminal justice system, in bids for public concessions among custom officials, and is rarely denounced because 77% believe that it will never be sanctioned. And in a recent report published by Maria Alvaro Casar and the Mexican Competitiveness Institute, 91% of those polled believe that political parties are among the most corrupt institutions in Mexico. All this with increasingly onerous effects for the country. Corruption, as you know, is linked to lower levels of GDP growth, it limits the benefits of commercial liberalization. It makes it harder to attract foreign investment. It generates a propensity for the occurrence of monetary crises produced by irresponsible financial and budgetary decisions. And if you want to know why Mexicans are taking their money out of Mexico, well, remember 1982, or 1989, or 1994, and the way the parity of the peso has become a sort of psychological metric for how people view the government's competence. Corruption also deviates resources that should be destined to the provision of public goods, such as schools and hospitals. Report after report on Mexican competitiveness, competitiveness underscores the fact that um, corruption is the main factor that affects doing business in Mexico today. A recent analysis published by the NGO Mexico Como Vamos, led by <clears throat> Liliana Rios, a former student of mine with them, suggests that corruption costs the country 2% of GDP a year. Corruption engenders a crisis of confidence in public institutions, a lack of credibility in the government, a widespread disillusionment of Mexicans with their country and with themselves. And how has the government responded to this crisis of credibility? I would say ineffectively, and the polls reveal this, underestimating or ignoring the problems or waiting for the election to provide them with a legitimacy they believe they have. Um, the problem is that the White House scandal, La Casa Blanca, and the Maginalco House scandal, and others, are defining issues for Mexico. They don't have to do with whether the First Lady was an extraordinary actress <laughs> whose talent deserved a $10 million bonus from the visa. They have to do with conflicts of interest within the government. I always say that in Mexico, um, los conflictos de interés ni siquiera son conflictos. This is the way things are normally done. Um, shady links between a powerful television network and political power, the way in which bids for public goods take place and then they are arbitrarily revoked, such as the concession for the high-speed train from Mexico City to Querétaro. If it was as virginal, pure, and transparent as the Minister of Communications had said just the day before he revoked the concession, why was it revoked? My hypothesis is because uh, Los Pinos knew that uh, the investigative piece of journalism of the White House was coming out that Sunday. And it was going to reveal that the White House, where the First Lady lived, the title of the house was in the name of the contractor who had won the bid for the construction of the high speed train for Mexico City. So these scandal, scandals have to do with the way in which political and economic power is exercised and shared in Mexico. In an irregular fashion, in an opaque fashion, in a discretionary fashion, without accountability. And the defensive, minimalist, and at times 
haughty reactions of the Benjamin administration. Uh, let me just remind you of the video that the First Lady released after, in the aftermath of the White House scandal in which she basically uh, <laughs> because we dared to ask what was going on with this house. And the fact that uh, the title was under the name of a contractor that had won these multi-million dollar contracts in the state of Mexico when her husband was governor there. So the reaction brings to mind that famous phrase incorrectly attributed to Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake. <laughs> it's a phrase that is used to criticize governments that are perceived as insensitive, frivolous, far removed from a population whose legitimate indignation they decry. As the head of the Benyamin cabinet, Aurelio Nuno did, when he referred to the post Ayotinapa demonstrations, he said in a derisive tone uh, that the public plaza had been demanding blood and spectacle. When in truth, and I know because I marched with many others, it had been demanding justice and accountability. Him and other members of the administration do not understand the dimensions what has happened. Because the PRI continue and the PRI and the other opposition parties as well <laughs> believe that it's the corruption stupid, but not as a demand for change, as a way of governing. That's why until recently the PRI had blocked the approval of a national anti-corruption system that civil society had been pushing for and came about as a result of a multitude of NGOs actually drafting legislation for the national anti-corruption system. But that's why the PRI didn't want and doesn't want, and as a result, we probably won't get an independent special prosecutor for corruption cases. And that's why the national anti-corruption system uh, in order to get the votes necessary for its approval, excluded what in my mind is a key area. It exempts the president of Mexico from any investigation of corruption and does not include the possibility of impeachment for corrupt actions, as is the case in many other functional democracies. So as a result of this recalcitrance, which I would call historic, um, as researchers from Mexico and Alua have suggested, Mexico carries a huge burden of institutional frailty. The absence of a system of accountability, of checks and balances that would allow institutions to process, pursue, and punish flagrant cases of corruption. The absence of a system to combat conflicts of interest with which to investigate high-level officials like the Minister of Finance, the First Lady, or uh, the President himself. That is the truth. And along with that institutional fragility, add the weakening political and investigative muscle of the media. Um, as someone who collaborated very closely with Gavin Arisegui until we were taken off the air, I do not believe that her firing uh, was coincidental or accidental or simply the result of a conflict between particulars, as many have argued. Um, if you were in Mexico today, you would realize the enormity of this, the weight of the silence in terms of everything that is not discussed in the media. Television, for example, never discussed, never aired the fact that the Green Party had amassed these huge fines as a result of violations of the law. Television, which is the vehicle through which 98% of Mexicans receive their political information, never disclosed 
that seven of every 10 Mexicans knew that the Green Party was giving out coupons for free medical services. Only three out of 10 Mexicans knew that the Green Party had fines for violations of the law. Add to that the silence of the radio, where topics such as Apatzingan, Ayotzinapa, La Playa, or recently Ostuna are never discussed. So as a result of this, the Mexican political class has been able to continue abusing, hiding, and evading scrutiny. For far too long, public officials have accumulated privileges and as the important article by Luis Carlos Uvalde called Why Democracy Means More Corruption argues, corruption has become more widespread in Mexico since the transition in 2000. Neither Vicente Fox nor Felipe Calderón considered combating corruption a priority of their administrations. And as a result, Mexico became a case that contradicts an implicit theory that more democracy means less corruption. The logic in the political science literature is that more democracy means more pluralism. Pluralism stimulates checks and balances in government. Pluralism is accompanied by greater citizen participation. And as a result, more people denounce corrupt practices but pluralism per se, it by itself, is not enough of a corrective for corruption. What is needed is not more pluralism, but the existence of the rule of law. In order for pluralism to contain corruption, it must be accompanied by a culture of legality and solid institutions that guarantee justice. And this simply is not the case in Mexico. And if you're interested, go to YouTube and listen to the audios of your, um, officials from OHL, the Spanish construction company, speaking of the bribes they gave to judges in the case of the, their construction of the Yaguco Vicentenaje. The table, the justice table in Mexico, lacks legs. Electoral alternancia and pluralism within a weak state in by the abuse. The absence of checks and balances, including the checks and balances that the fourth estate should provide, simply mean that corruption becomes more democratized as power becomes decentralized. In the past, public money was controlled largely by the executive branch and the president. Today, flows to the courts, to the media, where um, briefcases brief of cash <laughs> go out from residencia every month to the main newspapers. It flows to political parties, it flows to Congress, it flows where it is used to buy votes and power and influence. Corruption has been exported to the legislative and the judicial branch, and organizations that should act as counterweights to corruption become its accomplices. The dispersion of power has opened up many more windows for private business with public goods, as the cases of Lupo Iga and OHL underscore. And as that abuse becomes increasingly evident, the painful truth is that none of the institutional controls, internal, preventive, or corrective, put into place you now function as they should. And the national anti-corruption system isn't really going to kick in for years. In the meantime, the political class of all ideological strikes has not allowed the existence of serious, objective, and independent investigations capable of determining whether there was a conflict of interest or not, whether a public bid was rigged or not, whether the First Lady bought the White House with legitimately earned and taxed income or not. 
whether the Minister of Finance was giving it in exchange for a non-banking loan that he received from the contractor with an interest rate that has not been disclosed, or maybe it has, it was 5%. When the going rate, and I know this because I was paying uh, my own mortgage for my own house, interest rates at the time were 13%. Whether in exchange for this non-banking loan, which he got from a contractor, uh, many of us well, didn't know who we were. <laughs> um, led that contractor to win multiple bids for the construction of public works. We still want to know whether Raul Salinas de Gortari accumulated his vast fortune and his 49 properties, including five big passports, through influence management or not. Whether Lupo Iga won lucrative bids through influence management or not. Now, President Peña Nieto has argued that corruption in Mexico is a cultural, not an institutional problem. I believe that he is wrong, and it is exactly the reverse. Mexican citizens simply cannot count on an effective system to prevent or investigate or sanction corruption. And that's why it persists, that's why it grows, that's why it becomes increasingly evident. And bearing the importance of the national anti-corruption system, and that it truly worked. Truly worked to do what? Place clear limits on public power. Uh, elicit absolute transparency regarding decisions, performance, and results brought by public officials. And finally, that it includes sanctions that are effective and not politically biased. And while all of this takes place, and the Mexican government hopes that the Mexican moment is resurrected by energy reform, um, those expectations seem to have been dashed by the lackluster performance of the Ronda Uno, which was the first round of public bids for exploration of Mexican oil fields. Um, what is happening is that the Benjamin team is probably thinking that what they need to do is take cover, weather the storm, wait for the marches and the protests and the scandals to simply wane, wait for Mexicans to become tired, hope that what has been accomplished will ever eventually um, kick in and now uh, ensure enough breathing space for the political recovery focus attention on the good news that exports are up as the value of the peso goes down, that um, telecoms reform and the arrival of at and in Mexico will provide benefits for consumers, that domestic and international investors will eventually display an appetite to invest in the oil fields uh, despite the disappointing results of the Roma Uno, that official statistics show the number of homicides decreasing. But there's another important strategy for survival for the PRI beyond the PME administration, and that is its alliance with the Green Party. A party whose whole existence today is designed to allow the PRI to remain in power despite the unraveling of the Mexican law. A Potemkin party without whose support the Nieto would not have won the presidency or the midterm election. Without an alliance with the Green Party, the PRI today, its support stands at 30%, not enough to win the presidency. Bearing the importance of building up the Green Party as quickly as possible. And we saw this in the months leading up to the midterm election through a deluge of illegal television spots, ads in cinemas, billboards plastered around the country, a government-sponsored program that allowed the party to give out coupons in exchange for medicine. Thus, 
building a Green Party with a black history of corruption. A Green Party that was kicked out of the international alliance of Green Parties because it supports the death penalty. <laughs> El Partido Verde apoya la vida de los toros y los animales de circo, pero no la vida de los humanos. <laughs> and sadly, in the face of these often extra legal strategies, we have witnessed the passivity, if not the complicity, of the electoral authorities. A National Electoral Institute that would fine the Green Party and then the fines would be removed by the electoral tribunal. A National Electoral Institute that has fallen into its own crisis of confidence because it hasn't been able to accomplish what it was created to do, defend electoral equality, legality, transparency, and party spending. A coalition of us banded together in the months prior to the election, demanding that the, re the registration of the Green Party be taken away because of the illegality of its strategies. We presented a judicial document and managed to round up 175,000 signatures in a petition that was presented to the National Electoral Institute. To this day, the Institute has not even debated whether or not the illegalities committed by the Green Party amount to enough or the registration of the party to be removed. The law says that registration will be taken away from a party that commits violaciones reiteradas y sistemáticas la ley. To this day, we do not know whether registration can be taken away or should be taken away after three illegalities, 300 illegalities, 3,000 illegalities, 30 million illegalities, or never, as appears to be the case. And due to the lack of sanctions, limits, and restraints, the party strategy worked. According to the polls, and we saw this in the election, support for the Green Party grew from 4% to 7%, and 25% of its entire vote came from the city of Chapel where Manuel Velasco controls the electoral authorities and where in all likelihood there was voting for. Um, so on the basis of violations to the electoral law and violations that it took us years to ensure a level playing field in Mexico. And that is no longer the case. But the Pura was counting on the weakness of the National Electoral Institute in order to win a majority in Congress and pay with this strategy. And think about it. It is a strategy that now the party will legitimately use in the 2018 election. And the strategy is based on the premise of break the law, accumulate funds, it doesn't matter, win the election, and then with your prerogatives and the public funding that you receive, Pay off your funds and you're in power regardless of the fact that you broke the electoral law. Now, even if the PRI manages to retain its hold on power in the 2018 election, which will be a fascinating one to watch due to the emergence and triumph in several key places of independent candidates. The fact that those candidates won in places like Nuevo León, where an independent won the governorship, that speaks to the widespread disillusionment of Mexicans <laughs> with political parties and with their democracy. The widespread sensation of political orphanhood uh, that Ayotzinapa left behind us because in Ayotzinapa, even the left was involved. Hearing our collective anguish when faced with the certainty that public life in Mexico across the ideological spectrum has become corrupted. Hearing the collective disillusionment with crony capitalism, with ongoing conflicts of interest, accompanied with the dismay in the face of 
state and federal governments that refuse to open up information to citizens as they should to very prominent Mexicans. The lawyer and the head of Article 19 in Mexico demanded that the SAC, um, that uh, is the organization that, like the Mexican IRS, provide copies of the first lady's tax statements so that we know that her income to buy the White House was legitimately earned and taxed. The SAC has refused to reveal this information despite multiple petitions from the National Transparency Institute. So we're not seeing a comprehensive, coherent, viable way of addressing these issues of opacity and corruption. And I think worse yet, in this period of democratic deterioration, insecurity has become a common routine. There it is, a macabre punctuality of death. In Ayotzinapa, in the state of Mexico, which has become the most dangerous place to be a woman in the country. In Michoacán, in Tamaulipas, in Guerrero, in Ostuna this week. And as Ayotzinapa revealed, the Mexican government proves its impotence in the face of organized crime it has historically protected. The most indispensable branches of government, police, prosecutors' courts, evidence their dysfunctionality every day. And as Mauricio Merino argues in his latest book, the main challenge for Mexico is not only to save democracy, but to save the state itself, rescue its capacity to guarantee the minimum security that Mexicans need. Now, what about us? The role of citizens and civil society when confronted with this, this one position. We have, we have to be realistic. We have not been able to design an agenda capable of dislodging political parties from their complacency. There is a long list of individual and local heroisms that have said that the emperor has no clothes. There is Father Sumalinde, and there is Cardinal Aristegui, and there is Javier Sicilia, and there is the Centro Pobreache. There have been brave investigations and research carried out by CIDE and the Mexican Competitiveness Institute and the Higanos Conejo that generate methods and knowledge to evaluate the dysfunctionality of Mexican democracy. There have been student movements like Yo Soy Cinco de Mayos that demand more than what the government offers and are not willing to settle for this. But that has been insufficient. The root of deterioration continues because those who share power refuse to share it in a different fashion because the fundamental actors remain the same or have been co-opted or corrupted or silenced because at least it is clear to me that the vote for the pure eye is a vote for the past. And what is left for us to keep on demanding keep on treading the root of the insufficient until it becomes sufficient. Take advantage of social media as an alternative route for democratic action and dissemination of information. Um, and I'll tell you about three experiences that I've been involved in. Face the face, which was a demand for, for candidates to provide three basic pieces of information. Their tax, their income tax statements, their declaration patrimonial, and their declaration of conflict of interest. We pushed and pushed and pushed and um, got together thousands of signatures. Only 379 candidates out of 16,000 complied with the face of the face, which as civil society we should now not just ask for as a moral request, but demand that this become part of the law. Otherwise, we simply should not be allowed to be a candidate in this. Or the movement, Yo Contribuyente, 45,000 signatures, 
so that the government made public which states had received Fiscal. They had charged their public employees in impuestos sobre la renta, and then the Mexican federal government and Congress exempted them from sending in those taxes to the federal government in order to cover the holes in municipal and government spending that that government had created. The Supreme Court tossed the case out, saying that those of us who had pushed for it did not have interés legítimo in the case. The Supreme Court basically said that citizens of Mexico do not have a legitimate interest in finding out how their tax bills are spent. So we need to keep on pushing. Transition to active life as citizens in every sphere. Learn how to be full-time citizens. And that, I think, is slowly, very slowly happening in Mexico today. Along with the collapse of the Mexican moment, another more hopeful narrative is emerging. It's not being written by the Mexican government, but rather by the Mexican people. Those who are taking to the streets, to the internet, those who are becoming what dissident artists, I way, way called obsessive citizens, uh, those who but who, who felt that when Alejandro Gonzalez in Yagi Club that night at the Oscars begged for Mexicans to have the government that they deserved, that that phrase resonated with them. Thousands were fueled by the question of how do we turn the, the anger and the despair of 43 families into a collective movement? How do we resist and rebel better? How do we create contextos de exigencia so that the national anti-corruption system is more than window dressing, so that the national transparency law actually provides information to citizens who demand it? How do we learn to do things that we don't know how to do today? To lobby, to write, and draft legislation to create legislative coalitions with parties and how to push for more independent candidacies. How do we get people in power to resign when they have been involved in egregious conflict of interest scandals? How do we create a national debate over how to regulate the police instead of simply settling for the mando único that is going to just centralize mismanagement and corruption? How do we push for the investigation of untouchables like Arturo Montiel and Carlos Romero de Chavez and the Nino Verde? How do we create a truth commission for Ayotzinapa, supervised by the United Nations? How do we make sure that by law, everyone who wants to occupy or occupy public position in Mexico, where he or she has access to public money, present their patrimonial declaration, their tax statement, and their statement of possible conflict of interest. How do we end opaque and discretionary transfers of public resources to public unions? How do we reform public spending that has become a vehicle for renewed clientelism for political parties. In other words, transition from protests about Ayotzinapa to protests that have a broader, deeper significance that turn into concrete public policy recommendations for indispensable institutional renewal. A strategy that designs dissent, civil disobedience, resisting, proposing, learning, as I said, to lobby, mobilize, and create legislative coalitions. And I'm sure there are people here who will say, that won't work. Nothing of what we do actually matters. We're not enough to make a difference. We can't take on the PRI's machinery and society's indifference. We Mexicans have been taught to be the children of fear, of capitulation, of 
conformism. We have been trained to resign ourselves and to submit to the state of things. And if we look back at history, the history of humankind, it is necessary to comprehend that every change, every movement, every social innovation began with a group, a small group of friends and colleagues obsessed with an idea that seemed impossible at the time. The impossible idea that Mexico can and should be governed better and that citizens can in this country. The impossible idea of accountability, the impossible idea that the government will combat corruption instead of harboring it, the impossible idea that a democracy serves its citizens and not only its political parties, the impossible idea that the police actually investigates crime instead of handing over students to the criminals. I know that these ideas in Mexico seem impossible today. Just as impossible as the abolition of slavery and gay marriage and the legalization of marijuana and the right to choose and women's women suffrage seemed once upon a time. And disobedience in the face of ideas that seemed impossible is how progress is built. And Mexico cannot and should not be the exception. Where we still have a lot to fight for. The unexplained fortune of the Jones Salina de Gortari and the fact that it's considered legal where big government contracts are considered legal, where the Supreme Court ruled years ago in the case of the Acacho, the violations to her individual rights were small and legal, where conflict of interest is legal, where government officials do not have to dispose their assets and that is legal where the fact that the president and his team have incurred in conduct that would be considered, and I quote, unacceptable in a modern democracy, according to The Economist. So this is what we're beginning to realize as a civil society in Mexico today, how we have to combat and fight in order to pull the country out of its morass. And we don't always do so in the best of ways, as the violence unleashed by dissident teachers in Yerbeo and Oaxaca reveals. We still have much to learn in terms of mobilization and citizen participation and dissidents. And there are those many in the political class and in the business elites who criticize and oppose student, uh, citizen mobilization and protest. They decry the urban chaos that it produces, as it did in Uxla yesterday. The protest, as I have experienced and participated in for years in Mexico, can be beautiful because it alters the routines of time and space, allowing the impossible to seem possible. It can be beautiful because it comes from a good place place that uh, that place that um, that Woody Allen calls the stubborn little muscle that is any human heart that place that should remind us to protest against a government that we don't deserve and remember I think my favorite words from Martin Luther King the moral arc of the universe is long but it ultimately bends towards justice. In 2,270 years ago, justice for the two children killed by the army in Osuna on Tuesday. This talk is a small tribute to them, a small effort to bend the moral arc of the universe in their direction and in the Thank you.